How's everybody going today? Got us some little bit of news updates. We're going to be bringing on an amazing guest. His name is Matt Weiss. He does stuff with composing music. He hosts the show. He does a lot of sci-fi interviews as well. We're going to be bringing him on shortly. There were a few things for right quick. Bring into the news segment here on the home screen. Goodness. We have news updates right quick before we bring on that. Star Wars Outlaws gameplay reaction. They just dropped a brand new uh, gameplay reaction to the new Star Wars game that was dropped just the other day. An article about this with the gameplay trailer walkthrough on the site. We also have Transformers Rise of the Beast just came out this past week on Friday. Our review of that is live at SciFiction.com. You can read all about it. Uh, we'll probably watch the movie first before we read it. Uh, Jurassic Park's real villain is Nature. Article by Dominic Riley. Uh, amazing article about how nature is the real villain in the Jurassic Park franchise. Highly recommend checking it out. It's a great anniversary to the 30th of Jurassic Park. Star Trek Infinite Strategy Game announced at Summer Games. So this is a super cool thing. I'm waiting to hear back a little bit more information on this. This is kind of a teaser trailer. So highly recommend checking that out. Find out at SciFiction.com. And we got one or two more pieces here. Uh, last piece, Captain America 4 gets a new title and reveals the first look at Harrison Ford and Anthony Mackie. So there's that, all that stuff at SciFiction.com. We are going to, looks like Matt's here on, on the side here. We're going to bring him in the broadcast. And uh, here we go. Hello, Matt, man. can you hear us? I sure can. <laughs> Yes, sir. How's your Pretty day going? Good. My day's going good. I, you know, I'm not used to using Restream, so <laughs> the aspect ratio messed me up. So I can bring you can it see like a little bit beyond this. the edges. Oh, okay. Like hold that. on. You can do it like that's about the only two of the splice, but I can do it like this too. That that's pretty really tiny. <laughs> yeah. There you are. Oh well. So you can see a little bit stuff beyond the the set there. Watch this. This will throw your. Uh, your uh, there's your name, and there's your YouTube channel there promoted there on the box. You see that? Chronic Hasha Productions. There we go. There Except it it's That's over right. you or under you. Is it? Yeah, at least when I see it. Let me double check that. You sure. Well, no, that's actually the handle. Nowadays, you search that in the search engine. They changed it. Huh. Yeah. So it's all the. So what they do? It is on the site, but if you type that in the thing. That's the little round logo. It'll pop up to go subscribe. All right, folks. They change that. Subscribe. It's all changed. The Pranakasha Productions. Yeah, at Pranakasha Productions. Like and Your subscribe. Things, uh, yeah, like I said, always. Yeah. <laughs> you do a lot of stuff with interviews. You've like interviewed a lot of people. Andy Weir. and Talk about some of the stuff you do with Pranakasha Productions on YouTube. Yeah, okay. So Pranakasha Productions, uh, we do a lot of stuff. These days I do mostly uh, podcasting and interviews and things. Um, but I also have a Star Trek fan series that I do, and uh, we're yeah. working on. It's called Egotastic Trek because it's a collaboration between my channel, Pranakash Productions, and then a channel by JP, who's a real, really big in the or Orville fandom. Oh, wow. His channel is called Egotastic Fun Time. So we That's decided awesome. to call this this fan series Egotastic Trek. That's so, awesome. Yeah. So I'm actually working on episode so, five right now. Oh, so when did that? When what day does is that air on separate from the other one? Um, well, first we have to finish it. <laughs> I'm hoping <laughs> to get it done by August. Cool. Yeah, but there's four episodes That's, up there already. So there, and I have a playlist so on my. How many are you gonna do total? An infinite. So <laughs> well, I mean, I have like at least three more episodes swimming around in my head. And so I'm sure after I finish this one, I'll dream up another one. It's just an ongoing arc. So, sure, sure. yeah, and it's the Star Trek event in Vegas. So you're going to be at that as well. So you're speaking about Star Trek. That's true. I'm going to be at Star Trek Las Vegas there. for the third year in a row. And the difference this year is I'm also uh, going to be in charge of a table in the vendor room, which has to do with Space Command. Which is another show. What is Space Command for everybody who doesn't know what that well, is? They could get a thing on that. Funny you should ask. <laughs> so let's see here. <clears throat> Space Command is this. Now, 
Are, are this an audio only podcast or are there people watching? There's people watching and it will be audio on the radio tomorrow morning. Okay, so, bigger, so that means you'll have to describe what we're looking at. That is a movie poster, it looks like. Yeah. And it's got a lot of cast from a lot of sci-fi on there. It's like Doug Jones. You've got Robert Picardo, Billy Mummy from Lost in Space, Mira Furlan uh, from Babylon 5 and Lost. And you've got Ethan uh, McDowell, our good friend. And I forget the lady's name. That is the blonde hair yeah, lady, Sarah but she's Maracino. amazing. That's right. Yeah, that's right. She's a really talented actress. And then you've actress. got Bob Picardo. We got, yeah, that's a whole nice – they got the paladin. Don't forget the ship. <laughs> yeah, and I just got a 3D printer so I can start printing them out. If I can nice. figure out how to get it to work. Well, I, we can figure it yeah. out. If you got the file, I can get somebody to print it. We got a lot of buddies yeah. on uh, my friends and other oh. 3D, but some really good ones, a handful of really good ones. My current problem with my 3D printer is that it's the, the nozzle itself is about three quarters of an inch too high off the plate. And I can't figure out how mm. to get it to go down any lower. I, so that's why it's not printing right. Hmm. So I never use one. I have to figure that. I have to research that. Yeah. It's interesting. It's not really plug and print, like, play technology. <laughs> start watching YouTube videos that's about it. And for one thing, there's all right. these different types of filaments, which is the actual mm-hmm. substance that they use to make stuff or out of. Stuff, right. So right. it's a black art I discovered. Yeah. So I just you've got a lot of you've done a lot of stuff in sci-fi. Are, beyond the Star Trek event, are there any other events before or after you're going to be looking at going to possibly for the uh, summer schedule? Well, I am hoping to get to Comic Con, as you know. <laughs> so yeah, we'll be um, there. Well, okay. There's this. Is, is is there a panel to be announced at Comic Con that you and I might be part of? Yeah. So there's a panel, everybody. It's it's based on the series that Seth MacFarlane created, The Orville. We're looking at doing a panel down there. Uh, my buddy Justin's uh, kind of choreographing that. I'll be on the panel. We're looking at having Matt as possibly the host or moderator, rather. And then uh, we've got a whole gauntlet of people, Elise, uh, uh, who's doing the Orville video game. Uh, the gentleman that I believe does the Orville Wikipedia. Uh, some Possibly some of the actors and maybe some of the people involved in the show creation. So well, that's going to be awesome. Yeah, it's going to be a blast. Right there at Comic-Con, which is happening the end of July. Yeah. So. Yes, right. July 20th through the 23rd and 19th is preview night. And uh, so, yeah. Yeah. So we're doing that. So, yeah, that's the big things happening this summer. Sci-fi. Well, three big things. So Comic-Con, Star mm-hmm. Trek Las Vegas, and episode five of Egotastic Trek. <laughs> Heck yeah. yeah. Nice. Awesome. All those things. So the, uh, it's going to be a fun summer. All the goodness. All the summer awesomeness. Yeah. Your composer... Like when did you you've been doing composing for uh, the orchestra down there in uh, California or Seattle? I right, believe, Seattle, right? yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, how long have you been doing? That? Well, I have a concert coming up uh, Saturday, June twenty fourth, which is coming up pretty quick, and we have our first okay. rehearsal this Thursday, and that concert we're going to premiere a piece that I just wrote called the Operatic Rhapsody for Violin and Orchestra. That's so awesome. and I'm going to be the violin soloist in that one, and so my friend Ian Alvarez is going to conduct that piece and a couple others, and then most of the other pieces on the program I'm going to conduct. Um, and it's a it's a concert that features all new music, so it's quite a few local composers like me, and then a couple. We have one composer from Berlin, Florian Benson, wrote a really cool piece that we're going to premiere, and then we have another composer. Who I believe now lives in Holland, named Andre van Heren, wrote a really cool um, piece for for vocal and orchestra, and then and so on. Also, somebody from the UK named David Solomons. So, wide mm-hmm. range of composers and many these days uh, modern classical, if you want to call it that, composing mm-hmm. um, can be many, many different types of styles and genres. So a concert like this ends up being really interesting. So we'll have some stuff that's super avant-garde, like one piece, there's not even notes. Mm -hmm. All it is is a piece of paper. Well, actually it has letters which represent note, Mm -hmm. but then then arrows, it's called labyrinth. And you just sort of follow the arrows on the piece of paper and play whatever note the arrow takes you to. 
And then that That's creates awesome. sort of a, a soundscape as you have like four to eight players following this map right. at sort of at their That's whim. Cool. So that's like the most yeah. avant-garde piece we're doing. That's June June fifth. You said twenty June twenty fourth, Saturday, June twenty fourth. Yeah. yeah, and that's the Octava Chamber Orchestra, which is sure. I've been president and concertmaster of that group for fifteen years now. Wow, yeah, that's awesome. It's fun. You do stuff for like you've done stuff for all kinds of you've done stuff for television or film or anything like that uh, recently um, or, or well, come, come the only on. thing close to tv and film that i've done is the the music that i've written for my own show for ecotastic track mm -hmm. so okay. and um so that's why we were talking with um david reichlin the other day on a mm -hmm. zoom call and he's a, a well-known uh professional movie composer he's also the composer for space command and we were chatting sort of informally about that. So those guys have, their job is crazy. See, like for me, if I write a piece, like the piece that we're performing, um, my operatic Rhapsody, I had a whole year to kind of think about it and write it out, you know, and I knew exactly right. when it was going to happen. So I could kind of chill out and sort of let it bubble in my mind before I finally wrote it down. But like for someone like him, <laughs> They have these insane deadlines because what happens is you shoot a show, then um, you edit it and start adding mm -hmm. the sound effects. And then once the, all that's done, then you add the music. And usually by the mm -hmm. time it's turned, they want to add the music. They're like, come on, dude, get it. We need this done quick. We want to get this out like next right. month. So suddenly right. you are expected to be able to write all this music super fast and make it all sync up with the show and mm. sound great and, and do what the director was hoping would it would do and yada yada so it's it's there's a major time crunch that happens and you know and you suddenly just have to put out a whole bunch of great creative material just like that so i can't imagine doing that for a living i mean that would be such high stress uh, that's a lot of content too like, like two hours of a movie or even an hour for shows a lot of music like you had said before the interview right? it's huge well if it's if it's all going to be an orchestral score then it's a gigantic amount of work so like yeah. for example i give myself an entire year to write my my piece and it's only like you know eight minutes long whereas yeah. the show one tv show is 45 minutes when you take out the commercials <laughs> or if it's a movie then you're talking two hours or more so mm. yeah <laughs> Yeah, it's quite a thing. So you're big in the sci-fi. I gotta ask, what are some of your favorite? You were going to Star Trek. What are a few of your other favorite sci-fi's? I know you mentioned the Orville as well. Okay, yeah. So, well, of course, I grew up with uh, Star Trek, the the original series, TOS. So I started watching that. Actually, I tell people I started watching it in third grade when I was eight years old. But now I realize, mm -hmm. actually, my parents were watching it before that because I have memories mm -hmm. of watching the credits. And I must have been only like three or four years old. I was like yeah. hiding behind a chair looking at the screen and I saw the credits and I got really scared by that one alien. Oh, the little weird little thing at the end with the round head? Yeah, that looked like something from, from Outer Limits. And I think actually yeah. it was, from, I think it really was a prop from Outer Limits. Yeah. You know? They had auctioned that off about 2010 or nine or something like yeah. that. Yeah. It does not look as good as it did on camera then. It's kind of worn down a little. Yeah. It looks, it's know, a big egg-headed alien that looks really mean. It was a Balak, wasn't it? I don't know what it was. It's alter ego or whatever. But then was, uh, the show, okay, spoiler, but this has been out for like 50 years. <laughs> then I found out that the, the real alien that was running that, that fake mean alien was just a little kid. Mm. And he was showing right. them Tranya. And get this, his name thing, was yeah. uh, Clifton Howard, I believe. Well, that was, uh, yeah, Clint Howard was uh, Ron Howard's little bro brother. Yeah, Ron right? Howard from Happy Days. Richie Cunningham, his little brother, was the was the guy that was serving them Tranya. Yeah. So, did they dub his voice? I'm pretty sure they, they did because the, the voice didn't right. sound, it sounded too right. adult for someone that young. But anyways... <laughs> So, and I just found that out yesterday. I was going jogging with my friend, Jeremy, and he told me that, mm. that it was Ron Howard's little brother. So there's a what bit about, of like, fresh trivia for episode. you. 
<laughs> yeah, what are some of your favorite episodes from that the original series? Um, well, I always love uh, Trouble with Tribbles, right? They're basically Classic. the top ten ones of everybody's. Trouble with Tribbles, uh, Balance of Terror, a um, uh, piece of the action. Um, the then uh, shoot. Uh, What's the one city on the edge of forever? Yeah, with the portal. Yep, yeah. with the big giant donut of eternity. <laughs> and I used that in episode four of our uh, Ecotastic Trek. And awesome. um, I also use a lot of clips from Balance of Terror in in my awesome. show. You can't. I mean, well, you can tell. I mean, if you know Star Trek, you'll say, "Oh, I, that's where that came from." Um, also, I like the Enterprise incident because that's the one where uh, they try to steal the um, steal the cloaking mm -hmm. device, right? The Enterprise uh, incident. I think so. Enterprise incident. Was that season what's, uh, two or three? I think it's three. I believe it's three. the one three, yeah. where Spock, um, Spock and the Romulan commander um, started with oh, the girl affair, command. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that was a great episode. Um, Doomsday, Doomsday Machine. Machine. Yeah, I forgot about that one. That's a great episode yeah, too. And I also use a lot of Doomsday Machine in my show. Um, Very cool. So uh, also, I really like the arena. one. Um, I think it's called Tomorrow Is Yesterday, where mm -hmm. they go back and the Air Force pilot, uh, the Enterprise starts going into the atmosphere, and the Air Force pilot flies close to it, and they right. beam them aboard. That one. Don't doesn't he like have nothing to contribute, but his son was like one of the first pioneers of like deep space or something like so that's why they had to return him or something? Yeah, there was some reason why they had to return him. <laughs> and then uh Assignment Earth. That's mm. the one with the cat lady Gary, uh, seven. and and uh Terry Gars in it. Yeah. Yeah. And that was I found out later like, that uh, one was yeah. they sort of designed that one to to spawn a spin off series. It was going to be sort of like... Yeah, I heard that. Because they did a comic book about that. Gary Seven's character, they continued it after that somewhere on like IDW or something. Right. Like that. That's what the plan was, is what I heard. That It didn't catch on, unfortunately. So, yep. and in fact, I'm going to use yeah. parts of that in episode five. Uh, that'd be cool with the cat lady. Yeah. <laughs> episode five is going to be sort of a classic uh, Mission Impossible type of episode. So okay. I'm using clips from season one of Mission Impossible. With Leonard Nimoy. <laughs> Unfortunately, the episode I'm using doesn't have Leonard Nimoy in it, but it has George Takei in it okay. as a guest star. Same Star Trek studio. Yeah. Works. And the uh, franchise that you watch Next Gen, too, and some oh, yeah. of the others, you saw Picard, of uh -huh. course, without spoiling it, it was still kind of new. Yeah. What did you think of that, and how did you think – did you think it paid a proper tribute to the original Next Gen cast? I liked it. My biggest complaint about about season three was the mm. lighting was so freaking dark. It was like <laughs> we were in a cave the entire time. Right. So, and that's just you know that's a they decided to do that for whatever the director yeah. of photography wanted that for whatever reason. Uh, I think the reason they did it is so that when you finally got back to the Enterprise, the next gen Enterprise, and turned the lights on, it was supposed to be like this big event. Where suddenly um, it's that you're on a set that's lit up. So I think maybe that's yeah. what they had in mind. But for me, it wasn't worth it. You know. But wait, I thought the Enterprise decrashed on Viridian 3. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I don't know. So maybe it was, um, maybe they picked up the pieces and put it all back together again. Yeah, <laughs> gotta watch the show. <laughs> so uh, I also really liked uh, that Tuvok showed up. Yeah, the transmission. Or yeah, whatever, right? because I don't know if I told you this, but um, I actually played violin in Tim Russ's band. Oh, wow. yeah, because he he Tim Russ's band. Um, I sort I orchestrated. Uh, so I'm also a producer of Space Command, so that's why I'm helping set up, mm -hmm. get the table going in the vendor room, and I also Space Command had a New Year's Day party, and I hired Tim Russ's band to come and play play for the party be the band for the party and then oh, that's cool dude. through a long chain of emails and all everything i could do to try to convince him to let me play in the band he finally caved in right at the last second after i'd i 
I actually went and talked to his keyboard player, you know, and, and everything. And he finally said, okay, there's one song you can do with us. And it was literally like a half hour before they started playing. So I just got out there with my violin and we didn't have time even to give me a mic or a, uh, an amp. So like my friend yeah. took a cell phone video of it and it shows me sawing away to proving that I did it, but you can't hear a single note that I played because I'm getting totally blown away by the, by the electric guitar and the drums and the keyboards and everything. <laughs> so, but Tim heard it. He, he heard it in the keyboards. Tim and the keyboard yeah. player said they could hear me and they said it sounded really cool. And they thought it worked great. Yeah. Because basically all they said was we're gonna he, Tim goes, Well, it's kind of a blues song in A minor. And I'm like, Yeah, fine, I can do that. And so then off we went. <laughs> you know. And um it was I what I, from what I remember I played, I think it was pretty cool. Because I was trying to do this he was doing a lot of guitar solos and I was trying to sort of right. bounce off him and stuff like that and and whatever. Um right. so yeah, you guys the, have to go, uh, go look up the Tim Russ crew. That's Tim the name Russ of his crew. band. He's on, they have a Facebook page, I'm sure. He right? does. He's also got a YouTube channel. And he's put yeah. out a couple albums, actually, that I, are, if you just, if you search for Tim Russ on YouTube, you'll, you'll find, um, I think, every track on one of his albums. Um, yeah. These days, he, he sings with more kind of a grungy type of, blues and r&b voice but that particular album mm -hmm. it was more sort of pop sound and his voice sounded great and they're really cool songs too yeah. so the uh band is called what was it's it called, called tim russ crew crew yeah gotcha crew, it's like, like a star like trek a crew crew. enterprise uh, yeah i was trying yeah, the orville i was trying to you get him to go to orville. star trek las vegas so okay is he not gonna be there he's gonna be there but the band isn't as far as i know because uh, gotcha. of course I had an alt, I had a uh, an agenda. I'm like, okay, first goal number one: get mm -hmm. Tim Russ's band to Star Trek Las Vegas. Goal number two: convince him to let me play on the entire set. You know, <laughs> and then I'll be then I'll be like dressed up as Captain Hardinger from my show and stuff. But uh, that's for that's for another year. <laughs> so. The, the Orville uh, television series, we just got done season three on Hulu. Yeah, we got what are you looking forward to if they were to do a season four? What would you like to see? Okay, season four. What would I like to see? Well, of course, um, I want to see Brian McClure as a guest star um, and, or, and or a re, uh, repeating character. I don't know if you know who Brian is. Sure. So, he's in the Space Command. He's a Space Command. Um, Lieutenant Bradbury. Right? Yep. And he's buddies with Ethan McDowell, who uh, mm -hmm. I think I told you, I just uh, interviewed Ethan McDowell on my channel about a week ago. And Ethan- yeah, plays, I just saw the video on my feed, I have to watch that. <laughs> yeah, Ethan plays uh, Kemmer, Jack Kemmer. So he's like the main main guy on the show. Captain Commander, Captain, yeah. Yeah, and Brian McClure. And Brian's, both Brian and Ethan do a lot of TV work, so you'll see them mm -hmm. um, in various shows. Um, they were both in Walking Dead. Uh, I know Ethan was in Doom Patrol. Uh, what is it? Miss Marvel. Miss Marvel. Uh, there were some other shows he's into. Mm -hmm. I can't remember them all. He's both in, DC and Marvel and Cyber. Yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, Space Command and, mm -hmm. and so on. So he, does, he gets a lot of work these days. Oh, and he was, he's in um, uh, Are You There, God? It's Margaret. Is that how it is? That? That's right. He just did that recently. Yeah, right? and that's a really popular movie right now. Yeah. And um, he'll probably be in some cowboy shows now, since we did a little cowboy sketch about an hour into our video. <laughs> we both put on cowboy hats, and we started talking about cow tipping and cow zappers, and you know. Like, uh, i got to check this episode out. It sounds awesome. <laughs> I'm thinking of making a, taking that little segment and making its own little short video out of it. So... <laughs> Cause that was pretty fun. Was it called the uh, the YouTube Shorts or whatever? You could do a short. Yeah. Well, I haven't actually done any YouTube Shorts. Everybody says you're supposed to to help your channel grow, and I still haven't done it. They get a lot of traffic. Yeah. The one I did, I did one little tiny little clip that was put together of a Mandalorian. And it got a little bit of views, but I haven't done really much after that. So I just it's kind of still new. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, we're all busy juggling about ten thousand things at once. That's right. Um, yeah. So, so for the Orville, let's see. What do we want in season four? Well, I think right now I'd just be happy to have have a season four. True. Uh, let's see. Um, what do I want to actually happen? There's a particular episode that came out as a comic that's called what is it called sympathy for the devil i think is what it's called just ring a bell mm. idw it's it's an orville episode that they didn't do in season three that is a really mm. good story and i believe it's in the comic and i'm pretty sure it's called sympathy for the devil so i for sure okay. want to have them do that episode That'd be cool. Um, so is the a comic book adaption of the of one that they didn't do in the show. Right. I think they wrote the script. They just didn't they just didn't have the time and the budget to fully produce it, so then they just re- released it as a comic book. Is it a one off comic or is it like multiple pieces and parts? Uh, oh boy, now you're asking me questions. I don't know. I saw a comic, but I didn't know if it was like what the deals with that. Um like if it was like a whole series. I think it's just one episode, so it's probably one off. Off okay, of we'll have to look it up. And then they do some stuff in the movies, they break it in half because the season um, th- three had like longer episodes because they right. transferred over to Hulu and then the commercial segments. Are oh, really- wait a sec. Okay, did you watch season three? Yeah, I've seen okay, most so of the season. Do you remember season, for the last- when Gordy got lo- sent back in time? Yeah. That moment he got so sent back, back, if you watch closely or if you, or if you freeze frame it, there was actually mm-hmm. five versions of Gordy. That kind of, so we could follow like time another story. timeline of that in episode four, like a mirror universe or something. Yeah, like that. so I there's see. a possibility. Well, they did a mirror universe episode. Mm-hmm. Yep, yeah, and then was the one. Well, there's the water. Okay, so then there's that one. Okay, so what other mm-hmm. things could we follow? There's a lot of things we can we can, a lot of tangents we could follow. They had that one horror episode. Which mm-hmm. a lot of people were really jazzed about that one, but I'm not really that much into horror, so I didn't like it that much. Me either. Yeah. Um, though, uh, that one could, because they talked about that whole race of beings, they, there's a whole story mm-hmm. arc they could follow in that now. We explore that further for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah so. I like the Bioship episode with the big ship that was like a planet. The big ship that looked like a planet. Yeah, it was an earlier season, but they had like they go on it, and it's a whole like city in the world. It's like a big you know biosphere. Oh yeah, shape. okay. So that was kind of like that one Star Trek episode that was uh, right. That I think is called um, something to the point I, I my fingers touched the sky or something like that. Yeah, they had the big uh, kind of biosphere. Right, and that in, in the original Star Trek that was like an asteroid, a hollow hollowed out mm-hmm. asteroid. And there was the people that had that pain thing in the, in their forehead, and they go, ah, like that. Yeah. And that was the one. Okay, yeah, yeah. And also, Dr. McCoy had acquired a, um, a terminal illness, so he had decided he was going to stay on the asteroid with the woman that he fell in love with. And then, but then somehow he was healed so that he could go back to the ship and be on the show the next week. You see Enterprise with Scott Bakula, and if so, yeah. what, what are some of your favorite parts? Of um, I haven't watched them all, so mm-hmm. I watched uh, several ones. Um, I like the ones with the Andorians and the Vulcans. I like that plot line. Right, action packed, good. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of them, uh, they have Dominic and uh, Connor, and then a couple of their producers have their own podcast mm-hmm. now that's doing quite well. That's right, Dominic Shuttle and Pod, Trinidad, right? Connor. Have- Shuttlepod. Right, Shuttlepod. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, check that out on YouTube channels. They're predominantly on that one. They uh, do it once a week. They have a lot of great guests on there. Yeah. Well. They've got, uh, in fact, I'm jealous because they got Andrew Robinson to be on the show. Who, he played yeah. Garrick in Deep Space Nine, the Cardassian. Yeah. Original Taylor. Deep Space Nine, the Taylor. And yeah. I spent, I swear, I spent an hour at his table trying to convince him to be on my show. And he's mm-hmm. 80 years old now. He was like, well, you know, I'm just an old guy. I just don't want to do this kind of stuff anymore. So I said, okay, mm-hmm. fine, I give up. <laughs> and then he went and, went and did it, was on their show. So 
if he's get, I think he's going to be at Star Trek Las Vegas. So I'm going to go back to his table and say, "Hey, man, <laughs> you did their show, but you didn't do." <laughs> so that's awesome. He's really, Dude, into, he's really I don't know if Las you know Vegas. this, but he's really into um, Shakespeare. Huh? In fact, he was a oh, wow. professor I, at one of the big colleges. I think it's UCLA, one of the California mm. colleges. He was like the a professor of of theater and Shakespeare and stuff mm. like that. I didn't yes, know that he's a really well. good trained actor. That's why he could play Garrick he, so well. He's amazing. That character was freaking awesome. Yeah. The uh, Star Trek event, is there anybody there particularly you're looking at that you'd like to be on your shows? There's like 107 guests now. I think they're the total. Uh, to tell you the truth, I, my, I, I have my sights on the Orville people that are going to be there. Yeah. They're all going to be there. Yeah, most of them. Yeah. Are. I think there's like five of them. So I really want to yeah, be able to get... I want to have, I want to have one of them on my on my show, and then hopefully once that once I Which get one, one would you want to have well, uh, so um, Mark Jackson, for example, would be really cool. Mm -hmm. Any of them to tell you the truth. Um, Jay Lee, I would love to have on my show because I'd love to just talk shop, just talk music with him, because he's right. a really good classical pianist, and I'd love to really kind of pick his brain. And just talk about what it was like being a classical pianist when he was a young kid, and how he how he trans you know how he became an actor and all this other stuff. So that would be fun. Also, what about I, the, my, the other thing with him is I want to get mm. through the veneer that he puts up. Like you know how he mm. he always just tries to act real cool and real hip, right? But to me, it really seems like it's an act. So I want to get through right. that. And find the real Jay Lee. Right. So we'll see. Anyways, I think... So with the Star Trek, you got like a lot of Orville, but you got a way a ton of big Star Trek actors, visual effects artists, writers, and podcasters. And some actors like Dominic and uh, Sirach Lofton and Ryan uh, Huska doing their podcasts right. as well. Have you? Have you? Uh, have you? I'm speaking of question on side question. Have you ever thought about being there as one of the? podcasters down there because you've done a lot of stuff with that and i tried to i tried to uh this year i was actually before i before i landed the space command table mm -hmm. um i was trying to get a pranakasha productions table yeah and uh but i couldn't i i couldn't get anywhere with that and you know maybe that was last mm -hmm. year anyway i tried mm -hmm. and um so we'll see i mm -hmm. mean i can kind of now that space command's there and you're going to be there Right. I mean, then I can say, well, hey, folks, this is Pranakasha Matt here at Star Trek Las Vegas, sure. yada, yada, yada. We so should can... set up a podcast on the side of the Space Command booth and talk about Space Command and sci-fi and, you know, Star Trek and all that. Yeah, let's do it. We should. I'll bring some we, equipment. We can totally do it. You live stream it. You all kind of jazz. Beautiful yeah. technology we have here. <laughs> we can do it. Yeah. Yeah, so that, um, let's see, who else is there? I mean, there's so uh, many... Uh, um, celebrities. Uh, I want to, like, I want to, I'd love to have Penny Johnson Gerald on my show. Okay. Partly because when I first met her, I kind of freaked her out. Because <laughs> <laughs> wow. I was at, I don't know if I told you this story, but I was at Jay Lee's uh, recital, mm. piano recital, and there was several people from the Orville cast that were there. I just yeah. and before the recital started we were all just hanging out in the in the foyer there was like a bar and stuff like that and um i turned around and there was penny johnson gerald right in front of me about to order a drink yeah. so before i even thought of anything i just blurted out i love you and everything that you do <laughs> and she was like yeah. uh, okay <laughs> and then later i came over and i tried to talk to her you know, when mm. everybody was sort of hobnobbing. And then she right. just didn't seem that interested in talking to me. She's So I think I just really right. just, she didn't know what to think of me. So yeah. I would love to have her on my show so that we could joke about that and I could and I could redeem myself somehow. <laughs> We're going through all the guests on the- Yeah, look at my, look at my, oh, uh, I want to see, um, oh, she, wait, slow down, man. You go, there's Penny. There's Penny right there. Uh, there's Robert <laughs> Beltran. Yeah, uh, Robert Belton right actually was my acting coach for a while. Oh wow! Yeah, we used to do one-on-one -on -one Zoom calls, 
and um and he may uh oh there's sean kenny yep sean kenny is a buddy of mine too sean kenny um is going to be on the next episode of star trek uh or ego oh, really? he's going to be a guest star right. um and then he and his wife uh, tacky uh, and i are friends we actually last time i was in la they took us out to uh he and my wife bev to um their favorite pizza place because one of their buddies was playing electric guitar in the band and then the next day they took us out to this really nice uh restaurant for brunch and then we went driving around down to malibu and everything and just talked about a bunch of stuff and on that good old pch yeah that's just really fun oh yeah look at all these people uh tawny newsome there's There's tim Tim russ Russ. yeah tim russ so um and then the dude right next to him what's his name i forgot his name who is it the guy right next to tim russ Todd Stashwick. Yeah, and so he he's sort of a quasi villain on um, mm-hmm. uh, Picard season three, mm-hmm. but if you go to his website and sort of check him out a little bit, he's actually mm-hmm. kind of a goof off and really a creative guy. Yeah. So he would be really fun to interview. William Shatner. Wow. Okay. William Shatner. Yeah. Captain Kirk himself. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, and then there's Ball Chekhov. Ball. Yep, Walter Koenig. And then Wilson Cruz Wilson from Discovery. Wilson Cruz, yep. Let's go through all these real slow here. So many people. So Paul Wesley, New Kirk. Yeah. Yeah, that's the one thing. I just, for in Strange New Worlds, mm. I like him. He's a good actor. But he just doesn't look like Kirk. He's too skinny. Right. So it's just strange <laughs> that they cast him as Captain He does a good Kirk. job acting. He's not too bad acting. Yeah. So. Uh, Star Trek Las Vegas 57-year mission. August 3rd to the 6th, 2023 at the Rio All Hotel Suites, Casino in Las Vegas, Nevada. Yeah. So I, that's, that's my only, I really like Strange New Worlds. And yeah. um, so I really dig almost all the stuff about it. Um, that's the only thing I just, that casting him as Captain Kirk just doesn't work yeah. for me. Yeah. It, it just takes, that's yeah. the one thing that takes me out of the show. Yeah. And, what about the, uh, what are you looking forward to for season two? It's coming out here real soon. Um. I just have an open mind, so uh, I was, I'm just waiting to see what happens. Because, like I said, I really dug season one, and um, yeah. and I thought uh, what they did with Spock and Pring in season one was brilliant. Switch bodies. <laughs> yeah, they did. Yeah, they did a freaky cool. Friday. But even before they yeah. did that, just the way that the two of them interact, I thought was yeah. so good, and um, so that. That pretty much sold me on Ethan Peck as Spock. And yeah, they're I saw good. Him. It's almost like they're actors when they switch the bodies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they were It's good. almost like they're acting. It's They're damn good actors. Well, you go ahead with some? Yeah, uh, Ethan Peck was at Star Trek Las Vegas last year. And, oh, yeah? Um, so I stood in line and, and got his autograph and stuff, and then I, I told him how great he was and, you know, yeah. said, congratulations, you're Spock now. He did it, mm-hmm. you know, because I mean, to try to be Spock after Leonard Nimoy is a pretty tall order. So, but he, I just, in my book, he pulled it off. So he did. Yeah. And as, as did Zachary Quinto, I thought Zachary Quinto is mm-hmm. a very good, is an excellent Spock too. Yeah. Though Zachary Quinto had the advantage of having Leonard Nimoy ah, right in true. the same show with him, basically, that's right, yeah. uh, completely giving him, giving him his blessings. <laughs> You know, so uh, that was an advantage that Ethan Peck didn't have. Right. So, yeah. Um, okay, Strange New Worlds. Okay, so there's a couple of things. So um, I really liked in Discovery how they went back to the Menagerie. Mm-hmm. Um, though I wasn't too happy with the new version of the Telosians. I wish they would have just stuck with something very right. close to the original Telosians. Right. Um but that's what the big heads, I mean. the veins, and all that stuff. <laughs> um, it's a minor complaint, to tell you the truth. Um, oh, that was my favorite episode of Discovery. To, was that episode? Hmm. So, um, I hope they bring back some more Telosian stuff. Yeah, that would be cool. And because um, that's like his fate is when he gets in the chair, he becomes goes back to Telosians. Uh, there's a homeworld. So. Right. Um, 
another thing that I was expecting to happen in season one of of um, Strange New Worlds that didn't really, as I thought that the relationship between um, Spock, Una, aka number one, mm. and um, Captain Pike mm. would be a lot more developed. Mm. So I'd like to see a lot more with Una. Happened as yeah, he's she on trial, not in trouble. Right. <laughs> so yeah, so I was really. Um, I was really expecting that to be like the focus of the show, the three of them. Right. But what they did was instead they, they managed to expand it way beyond so that much more of the crew got pulled in, which was actually good. So, yeah. um, and well, we'll see. So that would be something that would be fun to see uh, develop in season two. Right. Um, of course, they, they'll they probably follow some more of that Gorn stuff. <laughs> um <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. A little different the, take on him. Yeah. Let's see. What else? Um, well, we'll probably see more of Captain Kirk. Mm-hmm. Um, though, again, I mean, just, I'm just not really sold on him. What as about Captain McCoy? Kirk. I mean, if he was some other character, he'd be great. But just as Captain right. Kirk, it just, it just doesn't quite work for me. You think it's like too early to bring him in? Like even any actor, it wouldn't matter who it was, or you think it was like wait off a little bit? It was like ten it takes place like a decade before almost well the first season does. Uh yeah. Kirk takes over command of the ship. I don't know. I mean, maybe it's too early to, to judge it. Maybe they'll write it really well and it'll all work real really good. Well, I guess we'll have to just wait and see. This, this comes out um, June sixteenth, I believe, right? Yeah, that's coming up quick. Yeah. Well, three okay. days. Um, something like that. Yeah. Well, let's just wait and see. What about the special effects and the aesthetic of the ship and like the, the how visuals of you, you like the way they've gone out with like the shuttles and this enterprise interiors and all that? Or? The sets, the physical sets are amazing. I think they're like great. Yeah. I love them. Um, uh, despite how good it's gotten, I'm still really not mm. that big of a fan of CGI. Because no. most of the time, I still can tell that it's CGI, you know. <laughs> I mean, nothing holds up to like if you go back and watch Star Trek: The Motion Picture, right? Practical sets. Practical nothing living. looks as good as that Enterprise, even That's now, because right. that was the most beautiful model there ever was. And that thing looked compl- totally real, for sure. And um, sure. yeah, and actually, I watched Wrath of Khan again in a theater. Mm. And apparently that was a rather low budget movie for a Star Trek movie, about the con. Yeah, but the ships in that look great too. They still hold that whole, like, just submarine. as good as anything yeah. else you see now. Yeah. yeah. So they I saw a way they did that. They put like a big tank and they spun up all this stuff. So when they're like looking down, and they're going in that Mutara Nebula. They did it. It looks gorgeous yeah. even to this day. The miniatures, the pyrotechnics, everything, the whole thing. Yeah. The opticals. It all looks great. Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah. You would What's your favorite that. original series movie by chance? What's the the six? Um, with the Hulkers? It's like most people. It's kind of a toss up between Wrath of Khan and also I really liked Undiscovered Country, yeah. which was, was the whodunit one with. Um, Conspiracy of all the stuff. Yeah. yeah and that was with Christopher Plummer as yep. the. As the Shakespearean Klingon. One-eyed Klingon. Yeah. <laughs> so that was a really good one. Also, The Whales, number four. Oh, that's, that's a kind of a comedic caper. That's yeah, well, there was another one where it had to be really low budget. And mm-hmm. so, in classic Star Trek style, since they didn't, they couldn't lean into the special effects, they had to lean into the story and the script. Right. So, you know, again, that was a really fun one. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. What about the next gen movies? What's your favorite and what's your favorite like character, like kind of, you know, relationship, something you saw in the film that really stood out that was like, you know, very Gene Roddenberry esque? Uh, my favorite next gen uh, was the crossover one with, I think that was called The Nexus, where we, ha- mm-hmm. we got to see Captain Kirk. Yeah. That um, was amazing. That was really good. Um, and then I also really liked the one. Where they went back mm-hmm. to Earth and saw the 
the invention of warp drive with Zephyr yeah. Cochran. First content, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was a great one, too. It's a great movie. Both those are, like, the best, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, I like Star Trek X, though. It's interesting from a standpoint. It's kind of like, if you think about it, like the Wrath of Khan of the TNG series. But, you know, you got Data dies, Spock dies. Data's memories transferred over to Data. Spock transferred over to McCoy. It's action packed. There's explosions. Same thing throughout the con, you know. I'm I'm not sure I saw that one in the theaters. I might have saw that. Oh wow! On YouTube or something. That was pretty packed. Or on Netflix. Yeah, I was on. Uh, they transfer. They've been hopping all the films. I think a lot of them are on Paramount Plus and Amazon now, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Some I know they have also YouTube has everything. It's, YouTube it and just download it or watch it or whatever. So. Yeah, uh, maybe I saw it on Paramount Plus. No, oh, plus I, I couldn't have right. because that was a while ago and Paramount Plus didn't exist yet. By okay. Amazon. Yeah. It was everything. Amazon had Enterprise and TNG. I think they have some of the other shows too and movies as well. So. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so we talked about Star Trek. Now, how long, do you, Star Wars? How long do you want to talk? <laughs> I'll talk, talk about three another, hours if you want. <laughs> we got about another five, five, ten minutes. Oh, maybe ten five minutes. minutes. Okay. Star Wars, yeah. Five minutes. So uh, the um, original Star Wars, Star Wars is great. The very first one. Mm -hmm. uh, the Empire Strikes Back mm -hmm. is, is also excellent. Um, when the Return of the Jedi came out, I got mad about that one because it bugged me that you could take out um, stormtroopers with spears and arrows I'm like, well, if even spears and arrows, if their stupid armor can't even stop spears and arrows, then why are they wearing it at all? <laughs> right. We got the, uh, what was the, uh, there's a lot of deleted scenes from that movie. They cut two or three, the one that I wish they'd kept in there, but it makes sense because it makes it more, you know, epic is the part that where Luke's working on his brand new lightsaber in a cave. Right. And he's got a little circuits and everything. And Vader's trying to reach out to him with the Force. Okay. And then he puts the saber together and puts it inside R2-D2. If we had had that, we would have kind of given away the fact that R2 was storing the saber. So, But it was still a very interesting scene. Okay. I um, found out that Qui-Gon Jinn's kyber crystal may very well be the kyber crystal that he used in that saber simply because he took Qui-Gon's saber uh, from... Uh, uh, Qui Gon when he died, and I remember his saber was green. So man, unless it's a synthetic, I don't think so. Ah, uh, no. Yeah. And it's the crystal that that determines the color of your beam. More or less. I mean, you got Ahsoka's is like, sir, is like pure Kyber or something like that. And then uh, Mace Windu's the purple. In the lore, he had saved some village or some planet, and they gave him some rare type of Kyber crystal, which he used to create his blade. Okay. Uh, the Sith always are red, a synthetic kyber, uh, green and blue. Yeah, you're right. They, they signify different aspects of the force. All right. All right let's jump on over. So we're going to, we're going to hyper jump over to the Mandalorian. Yes. And then we're going to skip over to Katie Sackhoff. <laughs> so Katie Sackhoff is somebody that I really want to interview sometime. Great, yeah. Cause I always knew her as Starbuck in the reboot of, um, Mouse Star Star Galactica. So I always thought of her as a tough chick, right? Yeah. But then somehow one day randomly I came upon her YouTube video, YouTube channel, mm -hmm. where she's clowning around with a friend. Um, it's Michelle Pfeiffer, right? Or no, what's yeah, the person's like, name? Somebody, yeah. The late, the Cylon lady. The really. Oh, you talking Cylon. about? Ah, uh, uh, oh man. Trisha. Uh, Trisha Helfer, yeah. Yeah, Trisha Helfer. So she and Katie Sackhoff are just going around in. California just doing goofy girl stuff. But they were so good. They're so <laughs> funny. Just off the cuff. So I had no idea she was that good at comedy. Yeah. So after that I fell in love with her and I'm like, okay, that's one of my life goals is to have Katie Sock off on my show. <laughs> so that'd be cool. We're still man. working on that one. That'd be great. Yeah. And she's great in the Mandalorian too. Yes. So that that of course is a more dramatic role. And uh yeah. Sure. And of course, Baby Yoda. Everybody loves Baby, Baby Yoda, Yoda. Baby Goku, whatever. The Dave Filoni. I mean, actually, yeah, John Favreau said we always call it Baby Yoda too. So. <laughs> yeah, I still call it Baby Yoda. Baby Yoda. Right. I know it's supposed to be Grogu now. What are you looking and I'm for? I'm so glad that they use uh, that Baby Yoda is real. Yeah, it's Baby animatronic. Yoda isn't, Baby Yoda isn't CGI. Right. 
Baby Yoda is as real as Kermit the Frog, Fozzie the Bear, Cookie Monster, and all those other Muppets that are real. Mm, for sure. The Ahsoka the television series, uh, what do you like to see in that before we wrap up right quick? And I got a little statement about the Baby Yoda. We'll get to that after. Uh, when am I supposed to About Ahsoka. About Ahsoka. Are you looking forward to Ahsoka? What, what are you looking forward to that? Um, I don't, to tell you the truth, I don't know enough about it. So... I'm not deep enough into Star Wars lore to right. it's all yet good. know. Um, but I did watch the other one, Endor. Oh, wow. Yeah. That was amazing. It was like Blade Runner or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that one. Um, it was slow starting, and I, I it, halfway through, I was like, man, this thing is, uh, you know, I don't know where mm. this is going. But then halfway through the season, then it, it hooks you in, and then you're like, you got to watch it. Diego um, Luna does such a great job as a yeah. character, man. So that was good. And one. the uh, show is, I think, renewed for season two. Baby Yoda, Grand Amara, before he passed away from Mythbusters, the host, uh-huh. actually built a replica of the Baby Yoda, recreate a whole, another copy of it to take the children's hospitals. Oh. And he, yeah, so I don't know what they did with that or what they're doing with that. That'd be really cool to continue that maybe with the 501st. If they're listening in the broadcast, they could maybe reach out on what they're doing with that. But that'd be really cool to be able to take that and just continue what he was planning on doing with that. Yeah, so and, you, not doing and you know he played Sulu in some fan series too, right? Yep. Yeah. Yes, he did with uh, Vic Mignogna, I believe, yeah. as well. And, uh, and uh, um, Larry Nimichek, I believe, was in that, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah, it's McCoy. Playing yeah. Dr. McCoy. That's right. That's right. I did one of Larry Nimichek's tours, by the way. So, oh, yeah, I forget about these. There's the tours of the set where they yeah. do stuff. Uh, the, the funnest part of the whole, basically, we spend a day driving around mm-hmm. to different on site or different on location places where they would shoot different mm-hmm. episodes of Star Trek. And by far, my favorite was we went to Vasquez Rocks, which is those triangle shaped mm-hmm. rocks where they shot the arena with the Gorn. Arena with the Gorn, and, yeah. uh, and apparently, they shot a bunch of TNG episodes there, too. Mm-hmm. And a few other TOS episodes they shot in that place as well. Westerns, all kinds of stuff yeah. about their last like, bazillion years. So what I did, wow. I, I was in my Star Trek uniform, my Captain Hardiger uniform, mm-hmm. and I had my phaser and everything. So I filmed a whole bunch of stuff of me <laughs> like shooting my fa- hiding behind rocks and shooting my phaser. And I did it on a tripod. I was just my phone on a tripod. So mm-hmm. I'm actually going to use that footage sometime in, a, in an episode in the future. I'm going to figure out how to do that. That'd be really that. cool. You could put in an optical effects and make it look like the beams coming out and color it up. That'd be yeah, badass. I can do that. I'll be able to do it. Right. So it'll, it'll look real and it'll be, it'll be right. something, I'll be some type of a thing with the Gorn. I'll figure out some way to, to CGI man or do something. That'd be kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. It's mostly, it's not so much the way I do it. It's not so much CGI. It's, it's editing, mm-hmm. being able to, to put different juxtapose, different clips and then mm-hmm. use green screens to, mm-hmm. um, then put new actors in it. And uh, basically almost all the effects I do are within Premiere, Adobe Premiere Pro. So I yeah. don't even have to use After Effects. I hardly, I, I have After Effects, but I hardly ever use it. Because <laughs> it can do all kinds of amazing things. But, well, that's totally awesome. Yeah. For people, right quick before we wrap up the show, where, I know they got your YouTube here. What other places can they go find you on the digital web or where can they, where can they find out about all your work? Um, you can follow me on Twitter. So, okay. and that's at Pranakasha. Um, and then maybe you can just put the link in the description of the, is this going to be a YouTube video, right? Yeah, it'll be YouTube. Okay, just throw it in the description. And um, I'm also on Facebook. You can Facebook friend me. Uh, if you Facebook friend me, it, it helps if there's something in your profile that indicates that you're, you're into Star Trek. Right. I For see sure. like a picture of somebody in a Star Trek uniform, I'll immediately accept them as a friend. Right. So otherwise, if it's something else, I can't tell if I'm if it's just a scammer or whatever. For sure. And uh, so there's that. I'm also on Instagram. Uh, I think it's yeah. also at Pranakasha. And uh, yeah. also, there's my Mount Weiss website, which is called WeissConcerto.com. Nice. And that has all my That's compositions awesome. and um, also links to a lot of my Star Trek uh, fan series YouTube stuff. Awesome. So yeah, man, I wanted to thank you for being on this broadcast. We got to do this again to promote some of these events. We're we both going to be out here coming up. Soon. 
Yeah. Oh shoot, we didn't have time to do any dad jokes. Darn it. Okay, so next time I got my dad joke deck right here. Oh, next nice. time we're gonna dig into the dad jokes. Definitely for sure. For yeah. Sure. Well, Matt, you have a beautiful day, sir. You too. Live long and prosper. Live long and prosper, you. sir. Yes, indeed. Or so as they we say all. in the Orville fandom, Jaloja, long and prosper. Jaloja. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Take care, brother. You too.